Zombie Science Part 5. We've been talking about the book um, Zombie Science, More Icons of Evolution by Jonathan Wells, just out last year. Um, it's a follow-up to Wells' book Icons of Evolution, Science or Myth. And uh, there's the cover. And uh, in Chapter 1, we read about uh, Who Let the Zombies Out, which is uh, introductory remarks about science, evolution, and trusting scientists. And I suppose that every book of this kind has to have some kind of a philosophical introduction. And then he talks about the tree of life and some of the difficulties with it and a homology. And um, then in the next chapter, he goes through the other uh, icons of evolution that he previously outlined and notes that Textbooks didn't change much in spite of the fact that they were called out. I suppose the main thing is Heckel's embryos are no longer reproduced directly so much anymore. Um, although sometimes they still are. Just amazing how difficult these things are to die because they're so useful. And we'll come across that, uh, we'll be talking about another useful uh, icon of evolution. Uh, then uh, the next chapter is a new icon that he didn't address the last time, which is DNA, which is billed as the secret of life, but in fact is not enough to specify an organism alone. And this has been well known for some time. And then the uh, last chapter we talked about was walking whales, which takes in the whale evolution series, which has taken the place of the horse. Some of us from way back remember the horse. It has kind of faded from view. Um, but it has the problem of missing the most important intermediates and of not enough time. And now it's really getting squeezed by a jawbone of a Basilosaurus, an actual whale that was found in Antarctica that appears to predate most, if not all, of the standard whale uh, series, which kind of makes that moot. Um, but today we're going to be talking about the human appendix and other so-called junk. The chapter starts out in the origin of species. Darwin discussed rudimentary organs from uh, which from being useless will be disregarded by natural selection. He argued that the existence of such features cannot be explained by a theory of creation by design. Why would a creature, a creator make useless organs? Notice that this is a theological argument. But if such features once had functions that have been lost, they would make sense from the standpoint of his theory. On the view of descent with modification, we may conclude that the existence of organs in a rudimentary, imperfect, and useless condition Notice imperfect and useless could go either for imperfect or could go for useless uh, or quite aborted, far from pressing a sta uh, presenting a, sta a strange difficulty, as they assuredly do in the ordinary doctrine of creation, might even have been anticipated and can be accounted for by the laws of inheritance. Interesting, we don't actually have any laws of inheritance from Darwin's day, but uh, 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 Darwin kind of glossed over that. Unfortunately, Darwin confused matters when he discussed flowers. The female organs of a flower included pistils, but we also find pistils in the male flowers of some species. In a female flower, the pistil guides pollen tubes to the ovary at its base. But, of course, a male flower lacks ovaries, so what, does it, what role does a pistil play in it? Well, Darwin said that the pistil of the male flower is in a rudimentary state. So did he mean it's useless? No. The male pistil remained, remains well developed for the purpose of brushing the pollen out of the surrounding anthers. 
Apparently, assuming all, that all pistils perform two functions in primitive flowers, Darwin wrote, an organ serving for two purposes may become rudimentary or utterly aborted for one, even the more important purpose, and remain perfectly efficient for the other. So Darwin used rudimentary in two senses in the origin of species. In one sense, it meant having uh, become completely useless, while in another sense it meant having lost one function but retained another. In The Descent of Man, Darwin tried to clear up the confusion. He wrote that rudimentary organs are either absolutely useless or they have such slight service to their present possessors that we cannot suppose that they were developed under the conditions which now exist. Organs in this latter state are not strictly rudimentary, but they are tending in this direction. So in The Descent of Man, Darwin settled on his first de definition of rudimentary, that is, useless. They're not strictly rudimentary if they have some minor function. In modern literature, the term vestigial is most often used to mean what Darwin meant by rudimentary in The Descent of Man, that is, wholly useless. So the argument for evolution goes something like this. Vestigial structure has no purpose, so it cannot be explained by a theory of creation. Instead, it is evidence of descent with modification from an ancestral structure that was once useful. The human appendix. One of the vestigial structures Darwin listed was the human appendix. Not only is it useless, but it's sometimes the cause of death skipping a paragraph, but we know now that the human appendix is not useless. Instead, it has at least two functions. One is to help and fight infections. The other is to provide a safe haven for beneficial bacteria. Uh, fighting infections. The appendix, as it turns out, is part of the human immune system. This system fights infections by recognizing molecules called antigens on the surface of harmful viruses and bacteria, then producing antibodies that lock onto these antigens to target the harmful cells for destruction. These functions are perfect, performed primarily by blood cells called lymphocytes, which act, interact with other cells and lymphoid tissues. There are many lymphoid tissues in the human body. Tonsils are among them. The other more important ones in humans are Peyer's patches. Interestingly, in birds, it's the bursa of Fabricius, and if you take that out, they lose their immune function. British anatomist Richard Berry reported that the human appendix is characterized by its large amount of lymphoid tissue. In fact, the appendix well deserves the name which has been applied to it of abdominal tonsil. Berry concluded that the appendix is not, therefore, a vestigial structure. Berry provided this insight not recently, but all the way back in 1900. Been known for a long time. A long time. Other scientists have since confirmed this view, and then um, uh, Wells gives a whole list of the scientists. I won't bore you with them at this point. Most of you don't have any problem accepting that idea. Uh, sheltering beneficial bacteria. In addition to defending the body against harmful bacteria, the human appendix provides shelter for beneficial bacteria. Certain kinds of bacteria in our intestines help us to digest foods and supply us with needed vitamins. In the case of severe diarrhea, when beneficial bacteria are flushed out along with harmful bacteria, the former need to be replenished in order to restore good health. In cases of severe diarrhea, when beneficial bacteria are flushed out, I'm sorry, in 2007, American biologists Randall Bollinger and William Parker and their colleagues suggested that the human appendix might serve as a safe house for beneficial bacteria so they can recolonize the intestine after diarrhea. Subsequent research supported their suggestion. In 2011, medical researcher Gene M. and his colleagues reported that patients who had their appendices removed were at increased risk for a serious form of recurrent diarrhea experimental evidence that the appendix is not useless. Yet Darwin's followers continue to call the appendix vestigial. And again, I'm not reading the whole thing if you're interested. It, it's a fascinating book and I suggest you read it, but uh, we don't have time for that here completely. Why Dar in Why Darwin Matters, Michael Shermer said that, a website updated in 2016 entitled Understanding Evolution, which is maintained by the University of California at Berkeley, said that. There is a holdover here, but it's not the appendix. 
It's Darwin's now hopelessly outdated view that the appendix is useless and therefore vestigial. Even some recent biology textbooks perpetuate the myth, and he cites the 2014 edition of Ravens and Johnson's Biology. And you can read the quotes, they're pretty clear. Useless organ or useless argument? In 1981, Canadian biologist Stephen Scadding wrote, the entire argument that vestigial organs provide evidence for evolution is invalid. Scadding pointed out that anatomical and experimental evidence indicated that the human appendix once thought to be vestigial, actually functions as a lymphoid organ. And uh, the arguments are pretty familiar by now. Um, another Canadian biologist, Bruce Naylor, called Scadding's argument erroneous and demanded an immediate and forceful response, lest it provide ammunition for creationists. You see, we're, we're talking religion now. According to Naylor, you vestigial does not mean useless, but surviving in smaller degenerate forms so an organ with some function can still be considered vestigial. Scatting replied, the entire argument of Darwin and others regarding vestigial organs hinges on their uselessness and inutility. Otherwise, he explained, the argument from vestigiality is nothing more than an argument from homology and Darwin treated these arguments separately, recognizing that they were in fact independent. And in fact, theologically, they are independent. We'll discuss that. In other words, if an organ in species A accomplishes one purpose and a similar organ in species B accomplishes some other useful purpose, the organs could be homologa hom homologous, but a homology inference should not be conflated with an argument for evolution from bad design. Scatting also objected that Naylor's less than perfectly designed argument was based on a theological assumption about the nature of God, namely that God would not create less than perfectly created machines. Scatting concluded, whatever validity, the, the validity of this theological claim, it certainly cannot be defended as a scientific statement and thus should be given no place in a scientific discussion of evolution. Zombie science versus scatting. In 2003, some defenders of evolution blasted people who cited scatting's argument against using vestigial organs as evidence for evolution. Again, I won't read all of the things they had to say. You can kind of make them up yourself. Uh, read Cartwright and Douglas Theobald for one group. But Cartwright and Theobald ignored the contents of scat scatting's reply to Naylor. They said, well, Naylor had it right, see? But, you know. Scatting came back and Naylor doesn't have a good answer. Jerry Coyne acknowledged that the human appendix may be of some small use since it may function as part of the immune system and it may provide a refuge for useful gut bacteria. Notice, he concedes the point, uh, the points that, uh, that Wells outlines. Nevertheless, Coyne argued, the appendix is still vestigial for it no longer performs the function for which it evolved. Uh, helping to digest um, um, uh, grass in rabbits, I guess. For example, the, here's the problem with that argument. For example, if the human arm evolved from the foreleg of a four-footed mammal, then the human arm would be vestigial because its original function has changed. But that is not what most people mean by vestigial. Some defenders of evolution have argued that the pelvic bones of whales are vestigial. In 2014, however, a team of scientists published evolution that a cetacean's pelvis plays an essential role in reproduction. According to one news report, common wisdom has long held that those bones are simply vestigial. But new research flies directly in the face of that assumption. The news report uh, quoted one of the scientists, our research really changes the way we think about the evolution of whale pelvis, pelvic bones in particular, but more generally about structures we call vestigial. Biologist Paul Z. Myers, a vocal defender not only of evolution but also of materialism, was furious. He criticized the scientists quoted in the 2014 news report for parroting common misconceptions about vestigial organs. 
According to Myers an organ is vestigial if it is reduced in size or utility compared to homologous organs on, in other animals. So you can see there's a big fight going on and it's interesting to ask the question as to why that fight is there. Um, I'm going to suggest that it's bait and switch but we'll look at that in a little more detail. Human tails. Midway through embryo development, the spinal column of a human fetus and the fetuses of some other vertebrates project beyond the rest of the body. And we're going to show you figure 3.2 in just a minute. Darwin considered this evidence that humans are descended from animals with tails. After development is complete, the spinal column in humans and some apes ends in a small triangular bone called the coccyx. The coccyx consists of three to five vertebrae that are fused together in most uh, adult humans. And here's the, f the figure that if you look at the embryo here, which corresponds to the human over here, you'll notice that, that there's a structure that goes all the way past the hind legs, uh, the le what the, where the legs will be. This is the arms up here. Um, and goes uh, and, and compares with the tail of a chicken or the tail of a turtle, both of which have actual tails although the chickens is kind of short as well. Um, Darwin regarded the human coccyx as a rudimentary tail. Though functionless as a tail, he wrote, it, is plainly, it, it plainly represents this part in other vertebrate animals. He argued that rudimentary organs being useless are no longer subjected to natural selection. They often become wholly suppressed. When this occurs, they are nevertheless, nevertheless liable to occasional reappearance through reversion. And in certain rare and anomalous cases, the coccyx has been known to form a small external rudiment of a tail. We now know that the human coccyx is not useless. It is actually an important attachment point for various muscles, tendons, and ligaments. It's actually been known for some time. Nevertheless, it is true that in very rare cases, a human baby is born with an external projection in its lower back. Actual cases, such a projection usually consists of skin-covered fat and contains blood vessels, nerves, and muscles. In 1984, pathologists Anne Dow and Martin Netsky classified projections at or near the base of the spine into two groups, true tails, which are fleshy, fleshy protuberances consisting of skin-covered fat and some blood vessels, nerve, and muscle, but no bones, and pseudotails, which are pathological deformities of the spine and spinal cord. I would think it would be the reverse, but whatever. The uh, labels are misleading because the true tails of animals such as cats and monkeys contain vertebrae. So the true tails of Dow and Netsky are nothing like the functional tails of other animals. They're just a bunch of skin hanging out there. Um, according to Dow and Netsky, the true or persistent vestigial tails of humans arises from the most distal or outer remnants of the embryonic tail. In 1989, however, pediatric neurosurgeons Sarah Gaskell and Arthur Marlin reported that Dow and Netsky's so-called true tails are sometimes associated with spinal cord defects that, if left uncorrected, may ultimately cause permanent neurological damage, which kind of implies that they need to be repaired. Furthermore, such projections can occur in locations other than the tail end of the embryonic spine. This fact, they argued, would tend to discount the hypothesis that these tails are remnants from early development. In 2004, embryologist Fabiola Müller and Ronan O'Rahilly wrote that the projection at the lower end of a human embryo does not produce even a temporary tail in the human. They argued that the term tail bud should be used for tailed species only and this is not appropriate for the human. In 2005, neurosurgeon Daniel D. J. Donovan and neurolo neurologist Robert C. Peterson wrote, uh, conclusions regarding the evolutionary significance of the tail and distinctions between true tail and pseudotail are clinically unimportant and should be abandoned. And then he quotes uh, pediatric neurosurgeon Michael Egner. Um, and uh, we'll skip over that part, but we're going to move to what's interesting is a phony case. In 2014, physis physicist Carl Giberson. Uh, that, by the way, is not physician Carl Giberson. 
uh, engaged in a public discussion with philosopher of science Stephen Meyer on the question, should Christians embrace Darwin? During the discussion, Giberson defended evolution and Meyer criticized it. Giberson argued that nature is full of examples of bad design and according to his account of the exchange, uh, which you can read online, to make his point, he showed pictures of otherwise healthy humans who had been born with tails. He asked rhetorically why the human genome contains in, excuse me, instructions for such features, and he answered, the scientific explanation is that we inherited these instructions from our tailed ancestors, but the instructions for producing them have been shut off in our genomes. Sometimes the ignore these genes message gets lost in fetal development, however, and babies are born with perfectly formed, even functional tails. Um, uh, I, I'm sure he got that from his medical practice. Um, Giberson showed the picture reproduced in figure 6-2, which we'll show you as soon as we finish this slide. It turns out that it was a Photoshop fake, though Giberson apparently didn't know it at the time. He subsequently apologized for using the fake photograph, though he insisted what he did was no worse than accidentally showing a picture of Plato when talking about Aristotle. Actually, um, in uh, Wells's opinion, I agree with him, it was more like using a Photoshop picture of Plato as evidence that Plato was Aristotle. During his embarrassing gaffe, Giberson continued to maintain that human tales do provide evidence for evolution. Uh, and there's the picture. Oh. By the way, <laughs> what's wrong with this picture? That's right, it's pointing the wrong way. It should have curled down and then up. <laughs> anyway, moving on, junk DNA. As we saw in chapter four, Francis Crick argued in 1958 that the function of DNA is to specify the amino acid sequence of proteins. The assumption that proteins builds the body led to the idea of a genetic program that specifies the principal features of an organism. By 1970, however, biologists knew that most of our DNA does not encode proteins. In 1972, biologist Susumu Ono published an article wondering why there is so much junk DNA in our genome. In 1976, Richard Dawkins offered an explanation based on evolutionary thinking. It appears that the amount of DNA in organisms is more than is strictly necessary for building them. A large fraction of the DNA is never translated into protein. From the point of view of the individual organism, this seems paradoxical. If the purpose of DNA is to supervise the building of bodies, it is surprising to find a large quantity of DNA which does no such thing. Biologists are racking their brains trying to think of what useful task this apparently surplus DNA is doing. But from the point of view of the selfish genes themselves, there is no paradox. The true purpose of DNA is to survive, no more and no less. The simplest way to explain the surplus DNA is to suppose that it is a parasite, or at best a harmless but useless passenger, hitching a ride in the survival machines created by the other DNA. Then, in 1980, two papers appeared back to back in the journal Nature. Selfish genes, the phenotype, Paradigm and Genome Evolution by Ford Little and Carmen Sapienza and Selfish DNA, The Ultimate Parasite by Leslie Orgel and Francis Crick. The first paper argued that many organisms contain DNA whose only function is survival within genomes and that the search for other explanations may prove, if not intellectually sterile, ultimately futile. The second argued similarly that much DNA in higher organisms is little better than junk and its accumulation in the course of evolution can be compared to the spread of a not too harmful parasite within its host. Orgel and Crick concluded that since such DNA probably has no function, it would be folly in such, in such cases to hunt obsessively for one. using junk DNA to bash design. Defenders of evolution have cited junk DNA to argue for neo-Darwinism, and as is so often the case, they have often used the notion to argue against intelligent design. 
1994, biologist and textbook writer Kenneth Miller, I won't bore you with what he had to say, you can make it up yourself pretty easily. Um, uh, that's part of it. Uh, I, there is another part that I will quote because it, it contains the gist of what everybody else says. If the DNA of a human being or any other organism represented uh, resembled a carefully constructed computer program with neatly arranged and logically structured modules, each written to fulfill a specific function, the evidence of intelligent design would be overwhelming. In fact, the genome resembles nothing so much as a hodgepodge of borrowed, copied, mutated, and discarded sequences and commands that has been cobbled together by millions of years of trial and error against the relentless test of survival. In 2005, biologist and textbook uh, writer Douglas Fichuma wrote, Michael Shermer wrote, Francis Collins argued in his book, The Language of God, the junk DNA provides evolution uh, evidence for evolution, though he later stopped using the term in light of new evidence that such DNA is functional. Hmm. The one that's actually looking at evidence and reading it the way he sees it and can change his mind. Philip Kitchener is one of that same group. Um, and then came the ENCODE project. The first draft of the human genome was published in 2003 partly by Francis Crick, interestingly enough, but it merely provided a catalog of DNA sequences and did not shed any light on how they functioned. So a second project called ENCODE for Encyclopedia of uh, DNA Elements was undertaken to investigate the functions of DNA sequences. ENCODE pr published its first results in 2007 after sampling 1% of the DNA in a human cell, semi-randomly, the ENCODE team reported that they had found convincing evidence that the genome is pervasively transcribed, with the majority of its nucleotide subunits being represented in RNA transcripts. Furthermore, the evidence showed that both strands, not just the, quote, sense strand, are transcribed. Not only were RNAs being transcribed but from much of our so-called junk DNA, but more and more of those RNAs were also turning out to serve important functions. In 2007, British biologists reported that RNAs transcribed from lines, long interspersed elements, which were thought to be a major portion of, of junk DNA, are responsible for silencing a gene expressed in human fetuses, but not adults. Which is an interesting question, why do cells change? Apparently junk DNA is part of the answer, or what's supposed to be junk DNA. Then in 2009, American biologists showed that RNA transcribed from signs, short interspersed elements, helped to control gene expression and concluded that this has refuted the historical notion that signs are merely junk DNA. Whoa. In September 2012, over 400 ENCODE researchers reported much more comprehensive evidence in 30 articles published in Nature, Genome Research, and Genome Biology. They concluded that the data enabled them to assign biochemical functions for 80% of the genome. Since the project had not sampled all cell types, the final figure was expected to be even higher. And of course, this was not welcome news. Skipping over a paragraph, the idea that most of our GNA is junk, it would seem, is dead. But wait, evolution requires junk DNA. According to uh, some evolutionary biologists, however, junk DNA is very much alive because evolutionary theory demands it. That's a good reason for assuming that junk DNA exists. Um, Canadian biologists Alexander Palazzo and T. Ryan Gregory point out that less than 10% of sequences are conserved, that is, they're similar, between humans and other mammals. Evolutionary theory attributes sequence conservation to function. And Palazzo and Gregory argue that unconserved sequences are not functional. And so, the number of human sequences that are functional must be much less than the 80% reported by ENCODE. 
Yet function has been identified in many non-coding, uh, non-protein coding RNAs whose sequences have not been conserved. As the subtitle of a report in the journal Trends in Genetics put it, a lack of conservation does not mean lack of function. So any estimate of functionality based on sequence conservation is an underestimate. Nevertheless, defenders of evolution continue to argue that functionality in human DNA is closer to 10% than 80%. It has to be. In 2013, W. Ford Doolittle, who argu argued for junk DNA in 1980, distinguished between two definitions of function. Causal role, whatever does not occur after deleting or blocking the expression of a region of DNA, and selected effect, whatever has or been or is subject to natural selection. Causal role is basically you delete the DNA, you kill or badly injure the organism, okay? How badly is a matter of debate. Uh, but Down syndrome survives, but it obviously is uh, not the ideal human. Um, and then selected effect, what is a, a basis of natural selection. So according to Doolittle, only the latter is really significant. Doesn't matter if the stuff actually is needed to produce a good human or a good animal of some kind. Uh, what matters is, uh, is natural selection working? I love it. In 2013, biologist Dan Grauer criticized a evolution-free gospel of ENCODE and accused its researchers of playing fast and loose with the term function by divorcing genomic analysis from its evolutionary context. In a lecture at the University of Houston, Grauer argued that if the human genome is indeed devoid of junk DNA, as implied by the ENCODE project, then a long, undirected evolutionary process cannot explain the human genome. Look at that. In other words, if ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. But for Grauer, evolution can't be wrong. His solution to the pro problem? Kill ENCODE. <laughs> really? So zombie science insists paradoxically both that DNA is the secret of life and that most of it is junk. On both counts, zombie science is wrong. Evolution is a science stopper. In spite of the evidence, defenders of evolution continue to insist that the human appendix, the human tail, and most non-protein coding DNA sequences are useless leftovers from a long process of gu unguided evolution. One of the surest ways to discourage empirical research into the possible function of a feature is to declare at the outset it has none. British anatomist Arthur Keith wrote in 1912 that for many years the appendix vermiformis has been regarded as one of the vestigial structures of man's body. Notice that was in 1912. An opinion which has prejudiced ag us against any real endeavor to, to discover its nature and function. Maybe there are biological features that really have no significant function but any theory that claims non-function at the outset obstructs scientific prog progress. Um, can we call that a science stopper? Evolution is not just zombie science. From the perspective of empirical science, it may also be the biggest science stopper in history. Now, my take on all this, I think there's a lot of wishful thinking regarding vestigial organs and junk DNA. To make it perfectly clear, the two arguments are essentially the same argument. God, if he exists, wouldn't have designed anything with totally useless, and in the case of the appendix, dangerous features. There are such features, therefore God didn't design life. Either he sat there and watched and kept his hands off, or he doesn't actually exist, and that, therefore his hands aren't on it. Notice that it is inherently a theological argument, not a scientific one. Well, except for the science of whether something is useless or dangerous. Notice that slightly useful features, especially features with little or no danger, are not good arguments against God as a designer. Think about it. 
Can you get along without your little fingers? Well, unless you're a piano player, yes. Are they vestigial? Notice also that it is not an argument against design. Just an argument against a particular kind of God as the designer. That's really important. It is not even an argument, let alone an effective one, against the argument that life of various kinds is designed and that we can tell that it is designed. It looks designed. There is no other good uh, uh, explanation. Therefore, it probably is designed. That is a perfectly reasonable thing in spite of the appendix in spite of even if junk DNA really were junk. The design requires explanation. Nor is it an argument against the traditional Christian God. The traditional Christian God is said to have created a perfect world, but imperfections and even frank evil were introduced by God, by the devil, by humans, by random chance, by some combination of the above is not directly specified, but clearly something happened at the fall. The only God that gets nailed by this argument, even if it were a true argument, is the God that keeps everything perfect, the God of natural theology. That one you can put to rest with this kind of an argument. Christians, I think, give up way too much when they regard the devil and evil as mythical. Now, but the arguments don't even prove what they're alleged to prove. The appendix happens to be useful. We know of its uses. And the appendix is not even particularly dangerous if one eats properly. Fact of the matter is that a Western diet, particularly one low in fiber, probably causes better than 90% of all appendicitis. Um, and uh, I'll just tell you a story that uh, I, a friend of mine um, uh, was a missionary in Africa. Well, he was a surgeon. While in the United States, he saw a case of appendicitis probably weekly, maybe more. You know, he gets over to Africa. He still sees appendicitis periodically from the Europeans there. He saw exactly one case in a black African and that African had moved from the country to the city and adopted a Western diet. We think it's the fiber that contributes to the formation of what they call fecal liths, little tiny hard pellets of stool. But because we often see those jammed into inflamed appendices. But in any case, there is a diet that does prevent it. And therefore, even the argument that the appendix is dangerous is saying, you know what, if you hit yourself in the head, you might hurt yourself. Well, duh. One can see that the concept of junk DNA stunted scientific research, and some would like to continue it, to stunt it in favor of continuing to believe their own theory. Kill and code. Don't do the research. We're afraid of what it might see, show. Oh, that last part was subliminal. Um, the pharynx that allows choking and is often claimed as a poor el element of design. Why not have the respiratory and the, uh, and, and the elementary canals completely separate? But it also allows breathing if the nasal passages are clogged and it allows speech using the lungs for power. Think of what you would want to have humans do if you didn't have the respiratory tract attached to the mouth. I wouldn't be talking here. You couldn't respond to me. I don't think that's a, an advance. Finally, I was amused by Giberson's faith but accurate defense. That seems to be the defense of all the icons of evolution that refuse to die, including Heckel's embryos. They're not really true, but they get the point across. It's called lying for Darwin. Now, before we get too smug, we need to be very careful 
about lying for Jesus. We have the responsibility of playing it right down the middle as close as we can go to the middle. Not favoring the other guys, but not favoring our own theories either. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. No. Oh, you just, yeah, we have. Go ahead. Um, the place where one of the authors apparently was using computer programming as an analogy for um, how to demonstrate intelligent design um, is relying on, shall we say, primitive computer programming. Uh, more current programming goes way beyond that kind of level to the point where the programs themselves are able to learn. And you have to provide the program with sufficient flexibility so that it has those options. When you do that, then the original creator of the program almost looks like uh, they fall into the, how should I say, backdrop, because the program is now taking off on its own. When you think that about that kind of a program, then you have to ask yourself, so is that program now designed or did it evolve? it actually requires a great deal more programming to give it the additional functionalities and potential, not less. Yes. But it doesn't look like uh, it's neatly organized in nice little discrete boxes. Yeah. The way it used to be when you had simple programs. Well, there, there's something that's interesting and that is uh, computer programmers who have worked with sufficiently complex uh, programs sometimes wind up needing to take over somebody else's program that's working. And they look over the code and it is very tempting to look over this little part over here and say, that doesn't really do anything. <laughs> but you remove that piece of code and you discover that, yes, it does. Sometimes, uh, somewhere, somehow. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, there are certain particular cases where if the program goes in this particular direction, if you don't have that little protection or that little uh, extra advice as to what to do then, the computer program grinds to a halt, or worse yet, will we'll pop in some kind of uh, extraneous data and give you uh, numbers that frankly aren't uh, what you should have gotten to begin with. Um, and I can tell you that uh, the design of computer programs sometimes gets really tight. Um, right now my daughter is taking uh, PhD uh, courses in computer science. And she's had the opportunity to ask me to, to try to help her. And so I've, I've gotten kind of into some of that stuff. And it's very interesting to see you try to figure out whether cache one has enough memory to do some particular thing more efficiently or not, or maybe cache two, which can then throw stuff down into cache one and the only way you can tell for sure that it's actually working is to just run it and see what kind of time you're getting. Um, but uh, in, order to, in order to do it, you can do it any way you w I mean, it pretty simply sometimes. But to do it efficiently requires real forethought. And, uh, you know, I can tell you that those computer programs do not get better if you just turn on the machine um, scramble a few values and then see what 
that comes out. Um, and uh, you know the idea of the idea of uh, replacing the programmers at uh, Microsoft uh, with uh, with a random number generator and uh, and 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 testing facilities just uh, it's not going to happen anytime soon. And you think of the body as being much more complex than that in a number of different ways. And the point of it is the design is there. These kind of things don't get rid of design. All they do is argue against a particular kind of designer. And you know what? I agree with them. That particular kind of designer doesn't exist. But that's not the Christian designer. Comment. As, as you were going over these details, I was impressed with the fact that all the arguments they're using are theological. It's just, it's just totally theology. And, and for years I've seen that, but uh, this, is, this is a deep impression. Um, I think radiometric dating probably doesn't involve theology, but most of the other arguments do. Well, I agree with you. Um, a lot of people don't realize, you know, you keep reading, I mean, this isn't the first time we've come across it. You know, that we, we need to keep this, otherwise the creations will get hold of it. Well, what if the creations are right? I mean, if you're being objective, you just, you know, let the chips fall where they may, right? But obviously, there are certain chips that we should not talk about. We should not, in fact, in the case of ENCODE, we should not even do them because the data that comes out might be harmful to our cause. Talk about Science Stopper. I, I well, the, because, because if we learn the wrong thing, then we have to accept that intelligent design is correct and maybe even that that uh, ask them don't ask me <laughs> this brings to mind a discussion I followed on a paleoanthropology listserv one time I, I have this all preserved the discussion was about a cross between a chimpanzee and a human that had been done I think at University of Pennsylvania that had been survived through the first trimester and they were discussing this back and forth among these paleoanthropologists. And finally, one of them popped up and said, we better not let the creationists hear about this. The very expression you used this morning. That's, that, that is a real sense that some of these people have. What happened? What happened? Well, that, that was the end of it. They, they went on to discuss the implications, what if you had this kind of thing going on, what, what, what about the moral implications and how people would react to it. But there was no doubt in any of their minds that the experiment had been done. Um, I'll just uh, complicate the picture a little bit by uh, saying the Christian view the biblical view involves the devil also, and he gets involved in the design. And uh, uh, the picture is uh, more complicated, but unfortunately, a significant part of the Christian community denies the presence of the devil uh, and his ability to. Uh, do many things that are described in the Bible and so on. Uh, so that uh, when we talk about design, we need to also use the broad, I think I talked the broad concept that uh, it may not be all by God. Yes, I agree. In fact, it's important to realize 
than an AK-47. An atomic bomb are carefully designed that uh, that design does not prove the beneficence of the designer. And it is not dependent upon it. And that cuts two different ways. One of them is we have to be careful about blaming God for certain things. If there are other actors involved who with less beneficence than God. But more importantly, it means that the idea of defending evolution against design by using bad design is really, if you think about it, a non-starter. We may find out that Cthulhu is the real designer. I don't think so, but we may find that out. But that wouldn't mean it wouldn't, wasn't designed. For those of you who don't know, Cthulhu is a uh, god in some particular universe that is maliciously evil. Um, in fact, I rather suspect that eventually pure atheism will go the way of the dodo. And then the real question will be what kind of a designer are we looking at? That's what I think is the final question. But um, and and I suppose we should be ready to face that question when it comes because it will come. But the fact of the matter is, the idea that there is no designer of any kind is probably doomed of its own weight. Well, just to follow up on your last comment, it's very interesting when those who don't believe a designer is possible begin to define what a, a designer would have to be like and do in order to be possible. As if, I know there is no designer, but if there were, the designer would have to have these traits and characteristics. Yes. In fact, there's, a, there's a, an article uh, that I think is entitled The God of the Galapagos, where some guy by the name of Hill, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, starts talking about the kind of the God of the Galapagos, and he finishes with the comment that he's not the guy, kind of God that anybody would be inclined to pray to. Well, the, the final part of that is, after they set up the straw man, they then look around and say, I don't see anything like that. Yeah. Therefore, there can't be a designer. And the logic defies logic. Well, what it says is that the argument is basically a theological one. But to get into slightly more controversial area of, uh, at least to me it is, uh, a designer who started life with a very small number of organisms extant who did not pre-design the characteristics that could and would be expressed to survive under different conditions would be setting up a dead end as many would think. So one wonders if maybe and here I'm just going completely off uh, any support period, but uh, one way of designing computer programs is to create a bunch of subroutines that can be turned on and off. Yes. As needed. Yes. One wonders if that might offer a way out of the dilemma of organisms being designed in such a way that they could survive under radically different conditions if they were pre-adapted. Yeah. And of course, pre-adaptation is a perfectly legitimate design concept. It is absolutely verboten to standard evolutionary theory. Yeah, well, 
I believe it's done all the time in the uh, data processing or the control worlds. Uh, you don't activate this particular sequence till a particular set of conditions come up, and oh, yes. it happens automatically. Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, one of the things that uh, well, one of the papers that my daughter was working with, uh, actually not personally on, um, somebody else asked her to help with grammar because her English is better than his. But uh, but one of the papers that she was working on was talking about sort routines when the uh, mass of material is so big that the likelihood of a mistake in the computer program to begin with becomes more likely than not. <laughs> and so now you have to now you have to not just have an algorithm that will work but an algorithm that will double check to be sure that what it's doing is correct. Then to make it ultimately much more complicated, let's now bring in free will. Yeah. Which of course doesn't exist. Well, uh, according, uh, to, according evolution. to the ev evolution. Exactly. Yes. Um, uh, while you're talking about pre-adaptation, we have a wonderful example of the new hospital building is pre-adapted to earthquakes. It's actually designed so that it can, uh, the foundation can move in either direction by some like 40 inches or so. And it has shock absorbers so that when the earth moves, the building more or less remains stable. Uh, this is a, a wonderful example. The building doesn't require earthquakes but it is able to handle, or should be, is designed to handle them with min minimal disruption. Actually, Why should love a life be um, less capable of handling perturbations? Actually, the same thing is true of the old hospital. The, the towers were designed to sway, but not actually fall. And uh, having been up with a uh, in one of those towers when it was swaying, I can tell you, it definitely sways, but uh, <laughs> so far it has not fallen. I've forgotten if it's Gould or, or uh, Dawkins that said this, but one of them asserted that the, if there was a God, he would have designed a perfect organism and it should only be one organism because if there's more than one, then the perfect organism isn't perfect. So, these, these false, <laughs> false assertions about God are pervasive. Well, actually, to be fair to those people, I'm not sure, uh, I haven't read Dawkins specifically on that, but I've heard other people express the same general opinion. Um, there are some people who uh, take Greek philosophy and, uh, and made that exact argument. In fact, it's one of the arguments for what they call the impassibility of God. God can't feel anything because feeling means change, and change means that the previous position was not perfect or else the position you moved to was not perfect. And so, and so it's an argument for a totally impassable God. And, of course, that involves a Greek idea of perfection which is it can't get any better. And that it's interesting because when God finished in Genesis 1, it is recorded that he said, it is very good, not that it is perfect. And apparently the standard is a little bit different for, for the Hebrew mind than the Greek one. And I think the Hebrew mind is closer to the truth in this particular area. Uh, restriction of outlook is on becoming to eclect, uh, an eclectic approach, and uh, we 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 need to be careful to, to not restrict. No matter what area you are, you and so on, uh, you're much more likely to find truth if you have a broader horizon than if you have a narrow one. I agree.
Well, if there are no other comments, we will stop now and we'll come back next week with the I. And as you'll note, there are several different aspects to that. Um, we've gone over some of them before, so some of these arguments will be somewhat familiar, but it's interesting to look at it from a different set of eyes, so to speak.